So I'd like to do some basic definition first and then explore that concept of a lithostratigraphic unit. So we have lithology, which you're already familiar with, which is essentially the way the rock looks. So that can be grain size, that can be grain distribution, type of minerals you have, color of the rock. And a lithostratigraphic unit is essentially characterized by the lithology. So that can be one or multiple lithology grouped together that form a unit. Now, a lithostratigraphic unit has no connotation of time. A lithostratigraphic unit is not a time unit. This is a very important thing to remember. The only connotation of time that you have is the law of superposition that we'll see later. So that means that a layer that is above is younger than a layer that is below in a stratigraphic record. That's really the only thing that you can say in terms of time about lithostratigraphic units. Lithostratigraphic units are separated by contact, and we will see that those contacts are very important. And in fact, for sequence stratigraphy, contacts are more important even than the rocks themselves. So it's important to pay attention to the contact between uh, stratigraphic units. So let's define the main lithostratigraphic units and subunits. Let's start with the smallest one. So we know that we start with lithology, and the smallest unit you can find is a bed that contains one lithology, but more often than not, beds are grouped into members. So a member is a series of different beds. Now, members are relatively small and they're not necessarily mappable. So that brings us to a group of members known as a formation. So here we have three formation, A, B, C. Now, formations are really important because formations are by definition mappable units. So you can do cartography with the formation. So that's why formation is such an important definition of the lithostratigraphic subdivision. Formation can then be grouped into groups. So we have here a group of three formation that contains any number of members. And groups themselves sometimes, especially in the Middle East, can be bunched together into supergroup, where you have multiple groups. And each one of these units is a unit of, of convenience that is here because we can recognize characteristics that groups the rocks together. So there's not really a lot of science that goes into grouping these units. It's much more of a convenience thing than it is a rational scientific grouping. But the important point is the formation is large enough to be mappable. That's the only rule that really needs to be applied. So here's a map of California around Santa Cruz, so the north of California. And the reason I'm showing you this map is because you can see multiple formations. So we have the Purisma, Santa Cruz, Monterey, Vaqueros, Butano Sandstone. These are formation names. And you can see that we can trace and map those formations very well at the surface, which was really the goal of 19th century stratigraphy. At the outcrop, this is how formations look. This is in Malta, it's part of my PhD. And the point is you can see the top upper coralline limestone formation at the very top of the cliff. Then we have this big package of clay that's very different from the limestone from the top called the blue clay formation. And below it, we find another creamy limestone called the Globigerina limestone formation. And underwater, we can't see it, but there's another member or another formation actually, the lower coralline limestone formation. But we can go and drill into these units, and that's what Fritz Hilgen did in 2009. And within the blue clay, he recognized multiple uh, formation members. So you have member one, two, three, four, and five, which are distinguishable due to their color and their clay content. Within the Globigerina limestone itself, during my PhD, I also defined some members because I recognized that there was at the top of the Globigerina limestone an intercalation of limestone and marls, and that's the upper member, whereas below we have much more limestone and almost no clays. In California, the Monterey Formation is divided into two main members. So here you have the middle member, which is an organic shale. You can recognize here multiple beds within that member, but it has a certain facies, a certain characteristic that makes it relatively easy to spot at the outcrop. 
By contrast, if you look at the upper member of the Monterey Formation, it's effectively comp composed of, um, of uh, silicate. This is a porcelainite and chert, and it's very, very different from the lower member. And the two members together can essentially be mapped as one formation. But I am sitting on a drilling vessel and everything that I've shown you so far is applicable at the outcrop. This is 19th century style of doing stratigraphy. So how does it work when you actually recover cores and you're not looking at an outcrop? So here's an example of how it's done on a drill ship or when you recover a core. We follow the convention of subdividing the lithology into units. So you have lithostratigraphic units. These lithostratigraphic units are characterized by the predominance of some lithology. For instance, here at the top of the core, we have mostly uh, limestone or ooze. So, so that's uh, carbonate rich sediments. Whereas at the bottom, we have mostly clastic clay rich units. And that's pretty much it. We just divide this into lithostratigraphic units, but we don't push it to uh, defining formation or members because you will not map these lithostratigraphic units. And you will see in the rest of this course that to trace different um, or to correlate different units, we often prefer to use chronostratigraphic or sequence stratigraphic concepts.